tell you that the first two years were outstanding. We had wheat, we got different cover crop mixes seeded, we had these great strips, we had awesome field days with between 40 to 80 people at them. Um, everything was great the first two years. So I was like, ah, oh, I'm gonna get two more years of this because this is going so well. And then we got into really wet harvests, and then we got into PP on a couple of our fields. And so really, by the end of this, I have some great baseline data, but I don't have a lot of long-term data from, from the four years. So um, what I'm gonna focus on, though, are, are the partnerships. And, um, and those partnerships with those original four farmers that were part of the grant are very strong, we work a lot with them, but I've met a lot of other farmers through them and through those plots and through those field days, uh, where we've now expanded to just on-farm trials that they're doing on their farms, so the things that we're measuring are they've come in as cooperators on their other projects through commodity funding or through um, NRCS or SARE or any of those things. They participate in our workshops, our SARE professional development uh, workshop grants as well. So um, so this isn't going to be directly related to the projects I have. If you go and look at the reports online, you're going to think it's what we've done is, is has yeah, the first two years would be great, the second two years would probably go, oh, what a failure. Um, but I think you'll see after what I what I put forth that, it, that it's really formed some great partnerships within North Dakota. Um, as I was going through this, I was noticing that a lot of the farmers I was talking with are part of the Soil Sense podcast that we have now. Um, so I'm actually going to walk through it in a way through their episodes and the things they're trying and the things they explain and describe so that you could go back and listen to those different episodes if you want to hear the farmers talk about what they're doing and what they're trying. Um, but I think, you know, the essence of our, of our podcast was, was this, which is exactly what the partnership grant is, is that, you know, soil health is a journey. It requires collaboration and curiosity amongst farmers, researchers, consultants, and extension. And those are the partnerships we've really focused on, and we have uh, people from each of those groups talking about their experiences in soil health um, on this podcast, which the second series now comes out on March 1st. Um, so here's another example of, of the work that we're doing. Dave Franzen is our soil fertility specialist, and he's gone away from doing fertility trials on research centers and taking them out to farmer's fields because it means more. It means more to those farmers to have in-field data. They've made changes based on those projects. Um, so here's Dave Franzen, who's one of the most traditional, rigorous scientists that you'll find, doing all these on-farm trials um, because it means more. And I think we can all agree with that. Uh, there also has to be trust, right? I mean, we can do all this work in the world, but unless somebody trusts us in the information we're providing, um, they're not going to do those things, or those, those partnerships won't develop. And so one of the things um, that we work closely on is this crop consultant does, Lee Breeze, is those partnerships, those relationships. Um, so I had said earlier when we were talking about, there was a presentation on, on you know, just the crisis that's happening with our farmers, right? The, the things that they're going through on their farms. And probably half, this, half of this past year I spent just trying to help farmers through that. And it wasn't always about, you know, that they were in a state of crisis or they were concerned or they had these concerns. It was, it was more just, hey, I'm going to be there and let's go look at some fields and let's talk about something more positive. And, um, and so that's where that trust comes in. And I guarantee any of those farmers now we have a trust that if, if, if I need anything, they're going to help me out on a project. If they need anything, they know I'm going to help them out. Uh, but here's one farmer that we work with closely, Sam Landman. He's episode five. Um, it's kind of like a calendar with these guys. They're Mr. Gene or July or whatever. Um, <laughs> but Sam is episode five, and he's Sam's a young farmer. He just turned 30. He's got his first kid on the way. And, and he's, he's up in north, uh, northeastern North Dakota. So many of those guys are still harvesting right now. Um, Sam was able to get most of his pintos off. He didn't have many acres of corn. Um, he's a cooperator on a large field scale project we have um, where he's looking at no-till pintos. We'll be looking at no-till pintos, corn, soybean, and wheat um, with a cover crop and then full tillage, no cover crop. And he's got an on-farm trial for that. But he likes, he's, he's getting more and more confident that he can just do, if he runs anything like vertical tillage, he's gonna do it in the spring and he's gonna keep his soils covered over the winter. And if he's going to try to get a cover crop in, it's going to be early. And if it's not early enough, he's going to skip the cover crop because he thinks that his planter or his, his uh, drill will do more cutting up of residue and more damage than it will if he just leaves the residue and doesn't have a cover crop because he wouldn't get enough growth. So making some really good, important decisions. Um, but he's got to figure out residue management. So this is one of his fields. It's got to warm up in the spring. He's got to be able to plant into it. Um, so he's concerned about low temperatures. He's concerned about it being too wet. I mean, these guys have ruts everywhere in their fields this year. Uh, but the no-till guys don't have as many ruts. I'll tell you that. They've been pretty proud of that this year. Um, the seed depth, hair pinning. He's very concerned about that with his equipment. Um, his stand, his emergence. Seeding into this is kind of scary for Sam. So he's got to figure out how to manage it. 
Um, so his approach, he's doing cover crops with bio-strip till. So in that case, it's planting his radish, he uses a sugar beet plate in his, in his planter, on uh, 30-inch row spacing, and then he comes back in the following year and plants his pintos on that. Um, so he's creating a space for, those, for the cover crops to be very intensified in a strip where he's going to plant his cover crop the next year, or his, his cash crop the next year. This gives him a little bit of relief of that wheat straw that he's concerned about. Um, but, you know, his re our reward, his reward is that there's no reason to till in the fall. He's had great stands with this residue. We've seen zero, you know, minimal difference, if not if, if zero difference between yield on his pintos, whether they're planted into residue or into, into cultivated soil. And he's looking for that moisture in August. And this year, they didn't need moisture in August, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what he's going to look for in those dry years. He's going to see, I think he'll really see the benefits of what he's doing on his farm. Um, Doug Toussaint was a direct cooperator, uh, episode 11, of the Share Farm, or the, the SARE project. I've got Share Farm, SARE, I've got a lot of different acronyms. Um, but Doug is, he's one of those farmers that five years ago he transitioned one quarter um, into no-till and use of cover crops, and then he transitioned the whole farm the next year. Um, so he's, his, his quote is, cover crops is not where to quit spending money. Um, one year he cut back and he didn't spend money on cover crops and he said it was his biggest regret that he didn't get every acre covered on his farm. Um, and so he'd rather have one fail than if he just didn't do it at all. And I think Doug is a man of few words. Um, oftentimes they're F-bombs and whatever. <laughs> but he's, that, that's what Doug says about his system. And so he will get his cover crops on every single acre and he will make sure that happens whether it's flowing on, seeded, um, however he's going to do he's going to get it done. Uh, but this is one of the, when we were finding, you know, the cover crops after wheat was not happening because the harvests were so wet, we just couldn't ask a farmer to get out there and add more to what they were doing. Plus the cover crops wouldn't grow. He, we switched his project to getting cover crops within sunflowers. And this one is, a lot of people are really interested in this. Um, he was looking at it for the benefits of getting some extra roots in his high clay soils. He wanted some beneficial insects out there to be predators for some of the, the pest pressures on sunflowers. And then he was looking to manage weeds because he just he felt like he didn't have enough tools to manage weeds in his system. So we did replicated strips. We had three fields for, I think now it's been three years that we've had those out there, 40 feet wide, 60 feet long. He seeds his, cover, his sunflowers on 30 inch row spacing. And then that same day he's seeding with the drill on seven and a half inch spacing, the cover crop mixes. Uh, we've got the mix down to you know 18 bucks an acre which he can spray that out if he has to and not feel bad about it um, and that's kind of our goal and we're seeing no difference um, statistically no difference in yield or oil content of those sunflowers there's still a 200 pound difference where the cover crops are 200 pounds lower than where he has no cover crops and even though it's not st statistically significant to him it's it's enough to be concerned about it so he will probably never take this whole field which is fine. I think he could get away with it on the borders of a field, or he could do strips in a field and not, not have that risk of doing the whole field, um, or the cost of doing the whole field. But he had a, a beautiful stand. These were some of the beautiful fields we worked in, because um, those cover crops were blooming throughout the growing season to bring in the beneficial insects. Um, his approach of cover crops on every acre, this is what he's often dealing with in the spring. Um, this was a late spring, too. so. He's got concern as he's, you know, his potential issues with getting cover crops on every acre are man hours and power. How many people they do, does he have to get out there and do these things? Um, to get around that, he's flying on more cover crops and having good establishment. Getting enough growth, having a mat of residue, other options of cover crops, what should he put out there, what should he not put out there, what can he manage? Um, but the, the, the reward is, he's always said getting in the field, not a problem. And he's not had a problem on any field where he's had cover crops. Where he's not had cover crops like cereal rye or winter rye, he may have potential issues. And that's what, that's what he loses sleep over. But you can see this field. So this is the one I was walking through in the middle of it. No, no issues. Walking through all that water on a 60% clay. And then that tile field I stepped into next, next to it. Um, that was the first step I took and that was the last one I took. <laughs> Didn't walk in that one. Um, his approach planting into something living. So this is what he plants into in the spring, and this is very different for the southeastern corner of North Dakota. I mean, this is not what you typically see. And he's got, you know, he's up to 100 pounds of cereal rise when he's putting on his fields because he likes a lot of green. I would recommend that for everybody, um, but he could have too much growth one year. If we have a dry spring, it could rob him of moisture. He could have too much water use. Um, seed placement equipment, he's, he's played with his equipment, he's put things on and pulled them off and tried to get it so he can get that seed in the ground in a consistent way. Um, but the reward, 
from this is that 9 p.m. phone call. Um, Doug is always very respectful of my time and only calls me during work hours. But one time he called me at 9 p.m. and he said, you gotta see this. And so that next day I was down there. And, um, and we looked at his field. This is his field that has had cover crops and no-till um, on it for I think at this point it was four years. Uh, they had a soybean crop on it and they went through harvest and two-wheel drive in the combine. This is the neighbor's field that, that has had rippers, chisel plows, field cultivators, um, wheat, soybean, rotation on it. They used tracks to harvest this. It was the same day and you can see the ruts. And he was so excited to see that. Um, and this is also a benefit where the guy, uh, the aerial applicator, uh, was flying over the field at the time, Eric, going to see cover crops in somebody else's farm that was starting to use cover crops. And we called up Eric and said, hey, can you swing around and take a picture? And he did, and this is, and this is what we have to show for it. So this was a really, really proud day for him. Uh, this fall, we went around to the same thing. We drove and we looked at, looked at his fields and came up with a plan. And he's left zero ruts in his fields. And everybody else was sliding all around on tile ground, on non-tile ground, and they had a really rough harvest. People were, were raising rippers in full season cover crops they had out there that were PP. I mean, it was, it was, there was a lot going on. Uh, but he, he was pretty proud. He got all of his crop off his field. And this is, this is what we saw this fall. This is Doug's field. We drove across it. He started laughing at me because we drove through a really a standing water area. And he, he looked at my face and I was, apparently it looked like I was really scared. Um, he goes, you didn't think we were going to make it, did you? And we sat and we looked at this field and you could just see on his face how proud he is of what he's done. And then this other field is tiled right across the road. Jeez. And that's what it was like in that field then got ripped. So those compaction issues are going to be reflected in that crop for years. The deep compaction. Uh, this is another farmer, farmer Tony that I work with in Jamestown. Um, he, he's been no-till for 15, 20 years. Um, he uses cover crops intensively on at least a third of his land, um, and he farms a lot, a lot of land. Um, so he's always out there seeding cover crops is the way he does it, and he farms a lot of sandy soils that he doesn't like seeing his soil blow away. And so he, for him, it's erosion. He wants to keep his soils in place. Um, this is an example of one of his sandy fields um, where he's... He had just taken this one over. He had a short season crop on it because it's a sand, so he adjusted his rotation. Um, had a short season crop on it, followed it with an oat cover crop. Um, he left it just, he just did oats because he wanted to come back in and spray over the top of it to control some weeds he had out there. So this is how his field looks going to bed for the winter. Uh, but he does have some concerns, lack of residue, um, too much water use potentially on a sandy soil, lack of growth. Um, but he's been doing, he's been getting a really, really nice stance. Um, he also uses residue to his advantage. So um, he bought a stripper head a couple years ago. This is how he leaves his wheat straw um, standing, a lot of bare ground underneath it. He comes in with a cover crop and seeds it, and people think it's going to be a nightmare the next year. Well, when the residue and everything's standing, it's not a problem to get into it. And so that's what he's learned, um, and that's what he's done. He'll catch a lot of snow, and he's caught a lot of snow this winter in this field. But it's even across the field, so it's going to melt evenly into the into the field. It's not patched up in low spots or on the edge of the field. He has that residue blowing around, um, so he has a very consistent field in the spring to plant into. And this was Tony's reward. I did a video from one of his fields that he just took over, um, and then one of his fields that he's been doing these practices on for 14 years, and they were just kitty corner to each other. And I picked up the soils, and it's the first time he's ever seen them side by side. He's never thought to take one soil from one field and look at it next to the other. And you could see in this how dark his soil is, how much he's built up with organic matter, and how much more moisture he can retain. Um, and for him, that was that he knew he always knew what he's doing is working, but this told him again that what he's doing is working, and he needed that confirmation. Um, I have an episode two uh, for this also, um, and I talk about the programming we've done. Um, so oftentimes, whether you're two miles away or you're 200 miles away, there's something that you can take from each other's systems. And so a lot of what I do is this network approach um, to getting farmers to talk and getting people in extension to talk and researchers and industry um, and consultants to talk. So all the green dots on here are, um, are NDSU people, whether they're researchers or extension. Uh, the red ones are consultants, the blue ones are farmers, and the yellow ones are industry. And so if you look at the idea of this is that you have all the locations where we've had programs, particularly this cafe talk, program that I do, uh, which Sarah is, is funding this year. Um, so we have all these talks and all these farmers show up and as they move to the center of this diagram and, and their dot gets bigger, that means they're, they're, they're <coughs> having more programs, they're potentially having more influence on people, 
um, and sharing conversations. So we have the people on the inside that are sharing a lot of information and showing up to a lot of events. We have the people on the outside that we want to get on the inside. So I can see where we're going to go. We're going to bring all the outside to the inside. We're going to continue to strengthen this. We'll get more people on the outside and keep this network building. And the idea of this is that one person can step away at any time and the network won't fail. So it makes it so that one person is not important. It's how everybody interacts that's important. Um, when we do this, we do another social network analysis where we have um, farmers list names of the three people they talk to um, from like research perspective and then three people they talk to in general about solo health. And in that one, the more somebody's name is listed as somebody that somebody talks to, the larger their dot gets. And so there are farmers that, that we can pick out that are very influential in their areas because people have listed them as somebody as a resource and they're talking to them all the time. And so that helps us with our program. We say, wow, I'm going to make sure that that farmer has the information they need, the tools they need, whatever they need to make sure that the information they're sharing is science-based, that it's practical applications, that we can keep soil health a science and not just an observation type program. Um, and then here's one of the farmers I rely on heavily, Joe Brecker, who's been 40 some years no-till. Um, and he's 20 years of cover crops, he's a very wise farmer. And he says, oh, every situation's unique. He never pushes what he says on anybody else. Every situation's unique, but he thinks that everybody has the opportunity to make these steps on their farms. It's just what steps they're gonna use and how they're gonna make it work. And so he, he, helps, he helps quite a bit. A lot of these farmers I call and I say, could you come to this event with me? Because I think that, that you could talk with this person or you know, they, they would benefit your, from hearing your message or hey, could you just be there? And if somebody has a question, then you can help them answer it. Um, and, they, and these farmers will do that now because of this network we've built and because of the relationships we've built. Um, so I'm very grateful uh, for that. And then uh, one last thing I want to show you is, so are we seeing changes? We do uh, pretty extensive evaluations um, every three years is what we've been kind of doing. And so this is from our program, and these are the topics, you know, establishing a cover crop and standing soybean using multiple species, diversifying crop rotation for inclusion of cover crops, establishing cover crop in corn, growing cover crop for seed, establishing after harvest using cereal <coughs> rye. And the green part on this, and this is a draft, this is literally, I was like, gosh, I show it or not, but this is, I wanna show it. Um, so it may change a little bit as we, as we clean up, continue to clean up the data. Um, but this is, in the green is what people are doing as a result of attending one of our programs called the Cafe Talks. So they are using these practices of cover crops now because they learned about them at one of our programs. This black area is where we see the most potential because they're considering it. Mm -hmm. And so these are the practices we are going to make sure that we show work. Um, establishing something in standing soybean, establishing a cover crop, that's where I'm going to focus a lot of efforts because 51% of people are thinking about it mm -hmm. and they need more information to pull the trigger and make that decision. Um, same with the multi-species cover crop mix. Let's help them find five species that really are going to work for them that they can control. Um, again, with establishing a cover crop and standing corn, let's find out if you fly it on or if you seed it or how you're going to get that cover crop out there, how are you going to modify equipment to get that done, um, and what mixes should you use. And then also that inclusion of um, diversifying the crop rotation, which we know diversifying a crop rotation is like the number one tool we have. And so if we can get away from two crops or soybean on soybean or corn on corn, we're going to benefit the system from a whole system perspective. And then the other things like growing cover crop for seed, 44% people aren't thinking of doing that, so we're not going to talk about it. It's not going to be something, I'm going to make sure they don't break any laws when they sell seed to make sure it's not protected or whatever, if they're going to start selling things or that they use certified seed or um, aspects like that, but I'm going to keep them out of trouble, but I'm not going to focus on it because they're not really interested in it. Um, and then this is another reward. This podcast has been played over 11,000 times since we released it on August 1st. Um, so when I see this, this keeps me going. Uh, this is one of those things that I need to see, that I know that what I'm doing is, is, is working. Um, and, if, and if I didn't see this, if it was only like 10 dots, then I'd be like, eh, probably not the right tool. So let's find something else and ask the farmers, what do they want? What do they need? Um, so I'll take any questions. Rodale is showing that they can build solar and gas matter with some amount of tillage. So have you got any, have you seen any of that? Good examples of that happening closer to home? Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that study that they're, that they're talking about. Um, but my thought, okay, when you think about tillage, right, you're incorporating plant material from the surface into the soil. And then you collect that soil sample and you send it off for analysis. So timing could be everything on that. Did they collect it after they chisel plowed it? 
or tilled it and then set it off and now you've got big chunks of residue that have a lot of carbon in it that are inflating that organic matter to say, yeah, this is working. Or is it in season and they're capturing the roots from the crop? You know, and that's why I think that test is very difficult because it depends on timing, it depends on how the sample is collected, it depends on, um, like I think a lot of people when they transition from a full tillage to a no-till situation, you know, they, they sample the tillage <coughs> where, you know, they don't have any of that residue on the surface and they could have sampled it whenever in the season. And then they come back in and that consultant is in their pickup and they drop the, the auger down to sample. They don't brush away the residue on the surface. So then that inflates that organic matter number that comes back because it's, it's determining litter as part of that organic matter pool. But is it? You know, I mean, that's, it's, it all depends on what you think is part of organic matter. And if, if I can identify it, I don't think it's organic matter. If I can say that's a piece of corn trash, then to me, that's not soil organic matter. That's it's residue, yeah. It's residue, yeah. Organic matter is something you can't identify. You look at it and you say, boy, I don't know what that was, but I bet it could have been a root, it could have been a piece of residue, it could have been something so decomposed. That wasn't the, the core part of the question. That, that has to do with sampling. And assuming that the Romeo people did it right, the question had to do with, I, I wouldn't disagree with you. No-till, uh, you'll have less disruption. But I guess the question is, have you seen examples where there's a limited amount of tillage where you're still building organic matter, or you just don't think that will work? I haven't looked for examples for that, but because the process is flawed, <clears throat> I can't even I can't even make an assumption on whether that could happen or not. Because some, it, I don't know. I've seen a lot of really inflated numbers in no-till systems too. But it's it. but yeah. So I don't I don't actually I don't even, I I guess I just don't really look at that number. So I don't know if it's possible. Is, is the reason you used uh, on right? Because originally you mentioned kind of when you're deciding which kind of cover crop you're going to use, you mentioned nitrogen mixing or legumes. It's the reason you didn't use a legume is because I can say it wrong now. Is because of um, chances of high nitrogen levels could cause like <coughs> not or issues like that with your um, pre covers. So I did use a like I use a mixture oh, yeah I use a mixture of annual ryegrass and Dutch white clover. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think my, my concern was if I did a pure stand of clover, it's a little slower to establish, um, and so that we would get some more weed growth that would be uh, coming up through that. Um, so that was my goal to have something that would okay. would kind of grow quickly and can't be over relatively quickly. Um, so yeah, I mean a mixture is 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 good. I, I would certainly consider doing a um, uh, pure stand, but I think having some kind of grass in there. It's kind of a good good balance. So you, with your um, your no your non plastic culture where the the cover crop was right next to with the root systems of the uh, peppers and things like that, you didn't see any high spikes in nitrogen that might have caused blossom and rot or any issues like that. <coughs> oh, spikes in nitrogen from having a legume in there? Yeah. Uh, no, no. Uh, and, and in fact, we saw probably a little bit of a nitrogen detriment to the crop. Okay. <clears throat> um, it, it takes a little while for clover to get going, right? So um, it's not doing a whole lot of nitrogen fixing until probably, probably realistically, probably the next year, you know, I would guess. So is your operation all organic then? You're, yeah, we're certified organic, yep. And then um, after you had your plant stick out and you had some established uh, cover, you didn't see a need to go in and just like broadcast whatever was left to put more cover there? Or? So, I mean, you could do that. Um, I, I'd like to avoid it. Part of the issue is that I, I didn't think we were getting much benefit when we were putting down winter rye in late October and then we were getting snow the first week of November. So, um, certainly you could you could go. You pro I don't really have an easy way to just, just like band it on those areas. And then you're probably broadcasting it over the whole field and you're probably wasting some seed. Um, so certainly you could do that, and if you had a crop that came out a little earlier and you thought you could actually get some good growth, um, then it might be worth doing. We, we didn't, partly because it was coming out like the 20th of October, um, and that was kind of part of the, the, the purpose of this. Like, well, if we, get, if we have 40 or 50% of our, our field with like these strips, you can do a pretty, pretty good job um, given your, you know, just the constraints of the, of the crop and the production system.